the Taiwan Design Center asked me to share some of my expertise with uh, how and where design can help with creating new business opportunities. Uh, being an entrepreneur and an owner of a design studio with offices in Taiwan and Taipei, uh, this obviously is close to my heart. So, as you see here today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what design can do for you, uh, what its strengths are, uh, the power of design, but also what design can not do for you. So uh, a lot of the time when we interact with our clients, we hear the same story. Oh, you know, we're, we, we're not so happy with uh, the results of the design resources that we have worked with. So I will dive a little bit deeper on why does that happen. I will keep the first bit very short. Some of you may not know who Create is and uh, who I am. So I put in three slides, not too much, about what my company is about. Then I will talk about the state of the world and how design thinking and the design process can help with that. Why people miss the mark? Why do we go wrong? And then also maybe that is because we're not asking the right questions or we're not even asking the wrong ones. You'll, you'll start understanding a little bit later. First of all, uh, Create uh, is a uh, 35 people design house. We have three offices in Taipei and one uh, office in the US. We have three disciplines within the company uh, with product design where we have 22 product designers, graphic design and branding and user interface where we have six graphic designers and mechanical engineering where we have four mechanical engineers. Um, Rather than presenting it in this typical, very cold structure, how most companies present uh, how the structure of the company is set up, I would like to stress it's all about people. People and their talent. That's what a good design studio sells. Manage it or good managed talent. So above being a design house, we are actually a, in the service industry. We provide a service. And we're only as good as the quality of the service that we provide. So doing a good design project, many design houses can do that. It's the total value proposition that we give to our clients. That's why they keep coming back. And that's where people are extremely important. If you look at the management team alone, we have 91 years of combined deep knowledge within the company. If you cal calculate the years that they weren't working for Create, it's 130 years of deep knowledge. Being in the service industry and typically in the design industry, this deep knowledge is extremely important for success. I'm sometimes amazed how easily people uh, jump from job to job. So I think that companies should invest a little bit more time or a little bit more resources in keeping those deep talents or that deep know-how within the organization. I also talk a bit about it because every time we have to deal with a new manager, there is a two, one to two projects we're struggling to get you know, everything going and to understand each other. And this is an opportunity for us to get blamed where we actually didn't do anything wrong. Maybe I should show the awards we have won because that's a, a good overview of the kind of products we have designed. Um, I will not talk about individual pro products here because this presentation is not about create. But uh, I may use a showcase uh, throughout the presentation here and there that, that uh, are our projects to prove my point. You will see, interesting to know, we have won 48 awards in the last 10 years alone, and we thought that will also be worth mentioning. So enough about Create. The state of the world. So let's start with the presentation. We all know it's not business as usual. You know, welfare programs in the Americas and Europe are failing or close are close to bankruptcy. For all intents and purposes, Greece, Greece and Cyprus are bankrupt, we're just not admitting it. 50, in certain segments of the Spanish population, 50% of the people do not have a job. That's one in two people does not have a job. And this is actually in the young segment of the Spanish population. The young segment is what drives an economy, so that does not look too good. To use my own country as an example, I, um, I am from Belgium. Uh, Belgium was out of a government. We did not have a government for one year and six months. We're actually in the Guinness Book of Records for the country that did not have a government the longest time. One year and six months, no decisions, no leadership, nothing was done in our country. We couldn't agree on anything. So that is not too good either. 
true. The America, it seems that it is uh, recovering a little bit. But don't let stock markets fool you. This is big industry. Small and medium enterprises in the US, they're not doing too well yet. So, and it's going to take a long time to come back. Leaders, big business from the past, are struggling to make ends meet today. Some are failing and are emerging millions of US dollars every quarter. Some of them actually even didn't make the downturn and went bankrupt. I'll use Kodak and Blockbuster as an example later in my presentation. So, okay, this does not sound very good. However, there is a tool to combat these new and interesting times. Um, organizations must work for entrepreneurial greatness through innovation in order to stand out in this uh, competitive market. Innovation is key. You will hear me say that word quite a few times today. Not with the only goal of increasing your profits, but with the intent to benefit an ever more sophisticated and more uh, well-informed consumer, thanks to the internet. A consumer that looks very different from the one we talked to not too long ago. Allow me to elaborate. This guy here, the empty one, is the old consumer. The black one is the new consumer. The old consumer was driven by prices. When the price was right, they would buy it. Makes sense? I'm going to do that. The new consumer is driven by total value. If the value makes sense, they will buy it. Even if it's more expensive, if it makes sense, they will buy the, 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 the solution. The old consumer accepted solutions. Companies would say, you need to buy a new car. Oh yeah, maybe I should buy this new DVD player. The new consumer does not accept that anymore and they want to be part of creating those solutions. Every mobile phone in the world, at least smartphone, every single smartphone in the world is different. Why? Because the apps you put on it, the settings you do, the music you add, every phone is different. The old consumer used to say, what's in it for me? What can I get out of it when I buy a solution? The new consumer says, what's in it for we? They're actually more eco-friendly eco and eco-conscious. Now, part of that reason you're going to be surprised, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. The old consumer, more stuff is better. I got to buy, buy, buy. You know, one car, two cars, one house, holiday house. New consumer is seeking experiences. So thanks to social media, we live in a hyper sharing world. Everybody shares everything with everybody. Now, in that case, for as an example, if I buy a bar, a bar, if I buy a car <laughs> or a bar, yeah. if I buy a car, I can put that on Facebook once, you know, bought a new car. OK, but the experiences that I have using my car and we went there and the car did great and we went to that. I can keep talking and talking and talking. So to go back one step, when I'm sharing all this with the world, you know, I want to look good. So I want to show to the world that, you know, what, what I'm doing is actually good. So that's why we're we're uh, a little bit more conscious about uh, the environment, all that, because it looks good also when we share that to the millions on the, the Internet. The old consumer used to trust what the box call out said, you know, healthy snack bar. OK, I'll eat it. And the new consumer, they will look at ingredients. They don't necessarily trust what big corporations or any company for, a company for that matter tells them. The old consumer used to receive brand information. You know, companies would tell them what they should like and not. Imagine the girl on the beach, very beautiful, uh, skimpy bikini. It's very hot. Drinking a Coca-Cola, oh, it's hot. Drink Coke. There is nothing worse than drinking Coca-Cola when it's hot. That was, that was old marketing. The new consumer is a co-creator in a brand. Brand will send out information to the world. And then again, thanks to social media, we will mold that information into what we think a brand is. That's something very different. And then this last one, it was unheard of. When, you know, not too long ago, when you wanted something, we all said, of course, you got to pay for it. Today, the consumer wants a lot of it free. We live in a, we live in a society where every consumer except, expects to get a lot for free. Free movies, free music, free everything has to be free. So when you offer solutions to the new consumer, you better have some free stuff. So design thinking and the design process can actually help with in, these, in these new times. They can actually help you 
to see that the right value proposition goes to this new and savvy consumer. That's what design thinking and design process does on a higher level. Let me elaborate. We have to go beyond the obvious and invest in expansive, game-changing innovation. You know, these examples show that breaking the mold in innovation pays off. So companies need to invest in the resources that can, uh, that can not only identify the problems of today, but they can anticipate what the challenges of tomorrow are going to be. These are the resources that can identify what went wrong with Kodak or what went wrong with Blockbuster before it actually happened. And designers and design thinking should be part of those resources. Why? Our creative design thinking will help with identifying some of these problems. Allow me to elaborate. So I'll use these two examples. Kodak invented the digital camera in 1975. In 1975, Kodak invented the digital camera, but they did not market it. Why? Because they thought the digital camera is going to interfere too much with their film business. And that's what Kodak does. We are in the film business. This short-sighted view, we are in the film business, was ultimately their downfall. What Kodak should have realized is that they're actually in the memory capturing business. Poof, the sky is the limit. And that kind of abstract thinking is what designers are very good at. Memory capturing business, very abstract. And then they use the design uh, process as a tool to create scenarios in order to build a, a brighter future. Blockbuster. Blockbuster regarded themselves to be in the movie rental business. They had shops all over the world. They were king. And then the internet age uh, hit them. What Blockbuster should have realized is Above being in the movie uh, rental business, they're in the instant gratification business. What? I want a movie, I want it now, and I want it as convenient as possible. Instant gratification. Again, a very abstract term, but it would have created much more business opportunity. Opportunity, sorry for that. So to use an example from Create, we have a client called Corsair. You may know them, they're on the show. Um, Corsair is a company that is specialized in DRAM cases, cooling solutions, and uh, power units. They're, for many, for many uh, mothers, they're regarded the Rolls Royce of that industry. Very high grade product, very good quality. Corsair came to us and asked us to design for them five new products. A, a massive multiplayer online gaming keyboard, a first person shooting gaming keyboard, and an uh, MMO gaming mouse and an FPS gaming mouse, and a gaming headset. Now, the underlying thing was the fact that they asked this, they asked this as individual projects, but we had to work on them simultaneously. And unknowingly to Corsair, this was actually a good thing. This was the best way for them to enter this new market you know, of gaming peripherals. So because we were able to convince Corsair to invest into a overarching and overcoupling design strategy. With as deliverables, a team, which we called reinforced, and core attributes that would be visible in all the products within that product category. With the core attributes were ex exoskeleton, exposed features, crafted, and symbiosis. Bear with me, it's gonna make sense. So this team and these attributes are actually what create a very, brong, a very strong brand identity. Why? Because the consumer realizes that these products, these five products, are built from the ground up following an overarching strategy and a very strong set of guidelines. Right? So all the attributes, the core attributes, are visible throughout the entire program. And by doing that, you create hyper-believability or super-believability, in German, uber-believability, because the consumer uh, recognizes that these projects follow the strict plan with guidelines when they were formed. So uh, an example you will understand very easily, Audi versus Ford. If you look at an Audi A1 and you look at an Audi R8, there are key elements in both products that you see, okay, yeah, that's Audi. There are elements in the lines, in the way they talk to you, 
that you see the A1, the smallest version of an Audi, and the most expensive Audi come from the same family. If you take two Ford cars and you pinch off the label and you put them next to each other, you have no idea where these cars come from. And that's so a, a team and core attributes actually guarantee that the right value proposition is forwarded to the right consumer. So reinforced exoskeleton, exposed features, crafted and symbiosis. Very abstract, but it gave a big picture strategy for our client in order to proceed. These are the products that we designed for them. I'll, I will not go very deep, but I'll quickly explain some of the core attributes that's so abstract, right? So what we did is that every keyboard comes with a metal plate inside so that it doesn't bend. And we said, put that as an exposed feature. Show off this metal plate and put it on the outside of the keyboard. And we did that for both keyboards. That looks cool, right? And then we said, OK, a headset also has a metal plate inside in order to create flex. Show that off as an exposed feature. Put it on the outside. And now we said, we can do the same with the mice. We put a base plate, which is metal. We bend it so it looks very cool. And now we put the components on that, and we create stiffness for the mouse. The way we treated these metal plates are actually uh, aluminum. We put very high fidelity hairlines on there, very high finishes. We did that through all the projects. That feels crafted. These comes with uh, volume switches that have knurled CNC milled wheels. Those wheels are in the keyboards. They're also in the mouse. People actually love them because they give a very good weight to scroll ratio. That feels crafted. Exposed uh, symbiosis, for instance. Symbiosis is how you act with a product, how, you, how, how the relationship between product and user is. What we did is that this is an FPS first person shooter keyboard. These guys only use these keys when they are playing games. So we said, OK, let's come up with a very specialized palm rest for gaming. So when they are playing games, their palm is supported to activate these keys. And then the keys is themselves are actually double injected with rubber, and they have a different curvature than normal mouse keys. So you don't glide off or you slide off when you are, when you are using them very fast. So, and then if you don't use them, you can take off these game keys, put them in the palm rest, and replace them with normal keys. So that, for us, symbiosis. So we created a very strong brand language for our client to the point that out of these two keyboards, the client has already launched five more keyboards and coming, I know, of other stuff. I hope Corsair is not here and can get angry. They have, we designed for them two mice. They now have seven mice with the same language on the market. We designed one head headset for them. They now have four headsets on the market with the design language. And for all these extra products, they did not have to hire Create. The design language was so strong that they could go immediately to the supplier and say, here, follow this brand manual, follow this strategy, and build follow-up SKUs on the core brand that we set up for them. And that is design thinking paying off. The customer, the customer invested in five products, and they got 16 products out of it, and counting. So design thinking needs to be looked at as a force for change, not just a surface representation of things. So as the Corsair example shows, right, design thinking is not only to solve design problems. Design thinking can solve business problems, as you showed, you know, how brand problems, company strategy problems, and even uh, brand penetration problems. So, Again, Corsair, they asked for five individual products. What, they, what we innovated for them was a brand that was the basis for a whole new business endeavor. They have spun off a new division within the company to handle this new product line. Um, so that's uh, design at its best. So we talked a little bit about design thinking. Allow me to go deeper into the design process. And I would not be a designer if I don't use Apple at some point as an example, right? So a saying from Steve Jobs, creativity is just connecting things. When you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seems obvious to them after a while. That's because they were able to connect experiences 
that they had and synthesize new things. And actually, this is true. Most projects I create start with a spark, uh, a bit of a eureka moment, and by connecting the dots. However, you can't have the best idea until you try a lot of ideas. So, yes, the, the basic idea, the innovation may come up as a spark, but then you have to go through an iterative process that involves observation, ideation, prototyping, and testing in order to refine that basic idea to the best idea. So, while Steve was correct with his speech, it creates some miscommunication and misunderstanding about design. Many people and managers think that we designers, we sit somewhere, we go, oh, get an idea, then we spend two, three days making a drawing, up, oh, job done. And that's actually not true. We sit down and have an idea, and then we refine it, refine it, refine it through these uh, tools that I talked about before. Why do I bring it up? Because the biggest problem we have with, uh, and that's a little bit maybe a Taiwan, with Taiwanese clients is, that's the perception of design. And, and if I were a manager and I thought the designers sit down and they, they, they sketch it, oh, got an idea, they sketch it out and they give it to you and they spend the week on it. And then I ask 30,000 US dollar for a week's work, obviously the, the manager goes, what, you know, who the hell do you think you are? And that's the misconception we have a lot in Taiwan where, where managers do not understand, we do need a month and a half to get from that initial good idea to the perfect idea. So design is actually a, a, a very failure prone process. You know, it goes through very early and fast iteration in order to get to innovation. It can be compared to actually uh, science. Whereas in science, you fail a lot, you try a lot, and slowly you will get to the solution. Where in design, you have to fail a lot, fail early, and do it as fast as you can in order to be successful. And we have a, a set of tools that we use in order to do so. so at Create that involves word association, sketching, brainstorming, mock-ups, foam board mock-ups, paper mock ups anything we can use, clay, uh, also CNC prototyping during a, a certain extent, but not that much. Actually, everything that can give us an advantage over 3D. That sounds weird, right? 3D is a very good prototyping tool when you're an engineer. Oh, I want to test the breaking point of an inch. You use, you, use, you use certain amounts and values that are calculatable that you put in your pro -E and it will tell you, oh, at that point probably your hinge is going to break. Design is not like that. You can't put in values about is it comfortable to use, is it user friendly, does it make sense, is the proportional scale all right, that you need to prototype. So, to make another analogy, and that's the last one, this design process can be compared to the explo exploratory versus regular tourist. The regular tourist has a very organized trip with you know, fixed expectations and foreseeable outcomes. Whereas the exploratory tourist allows himself to get lost in his new environment with much fewer guarantees and you know, greater possibilities of disappointment. The guy may get mocked somewhere, you know. But at the same time, it has also much bigger chances of unique experiences, unique ideas, and unique, unique things that can happen to you. This is what a good design process looks at. It's very messy, unpredictable, and easy to explain in the beginning of the project. And then as you go through a design project, it gets more linear, and actually here, with it's very easy to manage. Now, this non-linear project process is very difficult to understand in a very linear overall development process that is product development. So a lot of managers, they tend to not understand this, they don't want to know about it, so just let's not do this, you know. Give me just three ideas on Friday, and a final idea on Monday, and I want the final product by Wednesday, okay? That's easy, right? Let's not do all that in the beginning, I don't understand that. And that's very sad because we can't do our job. To use an example, I think not too many young people. You may still know the Motorola Razor phone. You know the Motorola Razor phone? Anybody from Motorola here? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, I'm good. I don't want to get killed at the end of the presentation. <laughs> so, the Motorola Razor phone, when the designers they did a good job, they designed this Motorola Razor phone, very new, very slim, 
and they went to upper management and said, look, we got this cool phone that we, you know, we think should be cool for Motorola to launch. Management looked at it and said, no, that's not Motorola. I mean, yes, it's a very cool idea. It looks sleek, but what one plate for all these keys? That's never going to work. That's way too advanced. This is not what Motorola stands for. Okay, the designers went back. They did not listen to management. And as a side project, they said, we're going to continue this Razer. And they went back to the next management meeting where they had a appearance model and they made the key plate work. So you could actually click it. The management looked at it and said, oh, cute, it works now. You know, wow, yeah, yeah, but still way too advanced for Motorola. That's not what we stand for. We're not going to do this project. And then some engineers in that meeting said, you know what, but a pretty cool phone. So they went together with the designers on the sidelines and made a working prototype of the phone. Went back to management, and only when management saw the working prototype of the phone, they went like, oh, 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 it works. I can use it. You know what? We'll give it a try. It was their best selling phone ever. Motorola went from flatline, Razer, and after Razer, boff, flatline again. Why? Because it was pure luck that this whole project happened, not because of great development within Motorola. Now you know why I asked about the Motorola thing. <laughs> and this is, this is part of the problem. They don't see, they don't understand this messy thing in the beginning, so let's not do it. And a lot of opportunities get lost that way. So, what did we learn so far? The brave new world tells us we need to innovate. Creative design thinking induces this innovation. Innovation starts from a gut feeling, connecting the dots, but it's refined through an iterative process. The design process helps in instigating this innovation, not only on a product level, but even on a brand level or a company level. Remember Kodak in the business of capturing memory, uh, the block, Blockbuster in the business of instant gratification? It can actually be looked at as a business tool. Now that we have identified those, I think it should be uh, fun to see what goes wrong so many times when uh, companies interact with design. To start that one off, I use a little bit of a joke. This is a representation of a development project. The project starts with a brief, a little bit of boring, you know, from the client, this is what we want the product to do. Then the designer goes crazy and interprets that brief completely wacky and, you know, makes it a design project. Then a guy like me, a design director, goes back to the client and presents the project as, oh, this is the most amazing thing that you've ever seen. You have to make this. It's great. Actually, what the engineer wants to do is something very simple, you know. Make it simple, make it easy for me. Ciao, howla, right? And then he goes through the roller coaster of production, you know, shrink marks, flow lines, finishes, and you end up in the store with this. Sadly enough, there is some truth in, in, in that joke. We have had ample a project where some of these things actually happen. So to start with the brief, let me talk a little bit about that. Where does it go wrong? So the client may be king, but he's not always right. And this, I promise this is the last time I will use Apple as a quote. You can't just ask customers what they want and then, and then try to give that to them. By the time you have get it built, they'll want something else, and this is true. Most briefs, most briefs are banal pronouncements of where the client wants everything. I create, it's un unbelievable how many creative briefs that we get to actually have poor developed business scopes and completely wrong assumptions, strategic assumptions, right? They, they tend to be, you know, copied versions of the last brief, where people take things from past briefs, put it together, and give it to us, and actually, the, more, the longer we work with our clients, the worse their briefs get. Because they tend to use one that worked, oh, this worked bad the last time, let's give this brief to these design guys. Or, oh, we worked together a long time, you know what I mean, you know. But it's crazy, right? You're gonna go into a million dollar development project and the first thing that will start a project is completely wrong. This misassumption all, all over. So we're, we're flabbergasted by that. Some of the common mistakes we get from our clients Okay, where, where do you want to launch your product? Worldwide, of course. Hmm, interesting. Who is going to be your target customer? Everybody. Everybody's going to want it. Right. What are the main specifications? What do you want on your product? Everything. I want it all. I want everything on there. 
These are very common mistakes, right? And if you do that, we don't know what we need to design. Another very common mistake is look at success stories from other companies. I, I cannot tell you, we want to be the apple of our industry. How many times a client tells me that? You know? And then I go, do you really want to be the apple of your industry? Do you realize what you're asking? Apple, in a very desperate but glorious move, hired Steve Jobs six months before it went bankrupt. That allowed Steve Jobs to make some very bold and very dangerous decisions within the company. You know? Because they were so desperate, he was also able to change the culture of the company. Many people don't know this. The people that work with Steve Jobs in Apple are the same people that worked at Apple when it was going bankrupt. Jonathan Ive was not some Eureka designer they found somewhere. He worked 12 years for Apple. So it was not the people that needed to change, it was the culture that needed to change. So now back to our client. You want to be the apple of your industry, so you want to actually make your company go almost bankrupt. Then you're going to find someone that's amazing and slightly crazy that runs the company, and that's how you, you understand what I mean? You need to know what you really can do with your project within the company. Even worse is customers that just blatantly want to copy somebody else. I do not understand why organizations think that people will shift from one brand to another brand if you have the same value proposition. Price? That's not true. Eh? People will rather buy a, a no brand than a copy brand. And actually, this was a little bit, and I have another, maybe there are people from BenQ here. <laughs> you know, I'm going to have to run fast. <laughs> yeah. So that was the problem of BenQ. BenQ didn't do really anything wrong, but it did not do anything new. It looked like a copy from Samsung. And if I was Samsung, and I was buying Samsung, yeah, great, but why do I have to move to you guys? I'm happy with Samsung. So they did not have a value proposition that made them look different to the competition. Uh, to use an example from Create, we had a client not too long ago that came to us and said, oh, we want to get into the, the computer gaming industry. You've seen a lot of game companies on the floor. And they used, obviously, Cougar and Razer and Rock Hat and the Scorpio brand as an example. And their brief was just a compilation of what these guys are going. And it was so bad that they said, like, oh, Cougar is an animal. Razer uses a snake in their logo. Rock Hat is an animal. Scorpio is an animal. We need, we need an animal name, too. What, monkey? You know, <laughs> game monkey. Honestly, yeah, well, come on, guys. You know, stand out from the crowd. Again, I hope that client is not here. <laughs> to use an example from our own, you know, we have a client called Apache. They are in the stapling, industrial stapling business for uh, making of homes and packaging, right? And they asked us to refresh their, their brand image, their company. We couldn't change the core attributes of the company, so we couldn't touch the logo or their corporate colors because they thought people identify with that. It's an old brand they know us very well. Great project. Who is your target customer? Well, they came back to us and they said, you know what? Our clients, they work in the construction business, the house construction business, or, or in the assembly line for packaging. They're pretty basic guys. They like women, beer, and tough sports. And you know, lo and behold, we looked at the entire industry, how they communicated with their target customer, woman, beer, and tough sports. The beautiful chick with the drill, you know. The calendar, 12 different chicks, you know, with a drill. You know, it's really what people do. And we counter we said, maybe your target group does like these things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But why connect it to their work? When we work, we all want to be professional. We all want to make a difference. We all want to have a meaningful job. So we countered and said, you know what? We did a brand and advertising strategy that built on that pride in work, the complete opposite of what everybody else was doing. So we did a brand campaign with them, building futures. It was a huge success for them. All the clients came to us like, oh, wow. I never thought of myself that way. I never thought every time I finish a house, I'm actually starting somebody's new future. Now, what are they going to remember more? The pride in their work or the blonde with the big boobs? You know? <laughs> and it's a huge success for them. Huh? Huge. We, and since then, we're doing their in-store branding, collateral, their, their, their advertising materials. Because they got it. And the whole industry, the big ones too, the whole industry was caught by surprise. Like, you know, client does not always know who their target is or what they want. So, the client is not always 100% right. 
I say here 100 percent because there is a lot of truth in what the client says, of course, and you can't, but it's sometimes that they just put it together in the wrong way. The parts are there, but they're not, they're not putting in the right direction there, and there is where design thinking can help. Maybe they're asking the wrong question, right? And not Apple quote this time, but Albert Einstein. If I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. So, most of the time in our environment, we're always looking for the right answer. What's the solution? Your boss will ask that twice, three, four times a week. What's the solution? But are you sure that you're trying to solve the right problem? Our, our society does not ask that. So we are always looking for solutions, but we're not asking what is the real problem. Why does that, ha why does that happen? Because we try to solve a problem from our own point of view. You know, uh, your likes and dislikes, your schedule, your behavior. You try to, to solve the problem from what you think should be done. Or the company's point of view, the processes they are used to, the expertise that they have, the schedule, cost. Or the worst one, the boss's point of view. Boss got a granddaughter last week. We're making this phone. Let's make it pink and put Hello Kitty on it. Boss is going to like that. Well, your target market is 21-year-old dude. He's not going to like that. Or, and that's the most common one, try to solve a problem to create financial success. Financial success should be a side effect because you innovated. And actually, the consumer will realize that you opted for the cost over the bottom line. You know, this is very important. They, the, the consumer is very well informed these days. So don't try to search for a solution until you know you're solving the right problem or trying to solve the right problem. How do you do this? Look at it from different individual point of view. Look at it from diff different individuals' point of view. So if you are designing something for a toddler, the toddler is the expert. And you should actually look at the world from his or her point of view. Go and sit on the floor and look up and see how toddlers see the world. So to use an example again, Create was a, I had a, a project where we were asked to design a sleeve for toddlers so they can use the iPad. You know? So OK, we did. We looked at this from the toddler's point of view and from the parent's point of view. And by doing so, we were able to innovate. First of all, you see, you see here, you have this big foam, V-shaped, book-like part on, that, on, that, on the product. And that's actually, toddlers sit like that. It fits nicely in the way they naturally sit right up. Also, when they lay down, the motor skills of toddlers is not very good. They touch things too hard. If you would use a normal stand solution, it would fall over. So with this one, they actually can operate the device. Another thing toddlers are not good at, Grabbing small or f flat things. They're not very good at that. So uh, an iPad is way too flat for them to grab. So we came up with these very big handles so that they can carry or drag the product through your house. Right? From a parent's point of view, the biggest concern what they have when the kid is playing with an iPad is how long is he going to play with the iPad? What is, what is healthy? You know. So we came up with a very simple timer solution, like a mechanical egg timer solution. And what this does is, it has a little, sw a little switch here, and on the back of that switch is a magnet. And they could time it up to half an hour, and it goes tick, 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 it goes down, until the magnet goes over the magnet that's inside an iPad for the smart cover. Whenever you close your iPad with a smart cover, it shuts off. This does the same. Now, why is that so interesting? If you have a toddler, and he or she is playing with the iPad, and you walk up to him or her and say, come on, it's enough, you know, you stop playing with the iPad. You know what happens? is the first thing that happens. If the device shuts, shut, uh, just shuts down by itself, they lose interest and start playing with something else. The second thing we invented for our parents is a very quick release system. Inside this colorful toddler thing is a very clean, very simple black iPad sleeve. Why? Because as a parent, you don't want to be embarrassed with a pink Hello Kitty, you know baby toddler sleeve when you're talking to your clients or your friends. So they can very quickly take out a normal uh, uh, iPad cover underneath there. So except from looking at things from a different individual perspective, we uh, also put a lot of attention in the question, why? 
my staff goes crazy. The first thing I will ask when they show something to me is, why? Why are you doing this? What is the reason for, for, for so? If the reason is, oh, because I think it looks pretty, chances are very big that idea is not going to make it to the final selection. So to elaborate, let, let's say somebody as a brief says, can you build me a bridge over this river? OK, why? Oh, because I want to get on the other side. Well, wait a minute. There's many ways to get, on the, uh, to, get to the other side. You could use a boat or a gondola or a, a zip line, right? Now, you could go further and say, OK, why do you need to be on the other side? Oh, because, you know, I want to start a job there. Wait a minute. Maybe you can work from home, and we don't have to build a bridge at all. Or there is a branch office on this side of the river, and we don't have to build a bridge at all. So why very important? Why is a very important word? Then you should also be able to ask the wrong question or a stupid question. Now, what is the definition of a stupid question? A question for which the answer is very obvious. But many times, the obvious is just some common practice that people have been doing for many years, so they don't question it. By questioning the obvious, sometimes you can innovate. So, for instance, I'll, I'll, it will come clear. How do you connect handles to a walk? You know, you, all, you guys all use a walk, right? You have two handles on a walk. Oh, you rivet. You have these rivets here that, you know, you rivet the handles into a walk, right? That's how it's done. Can you cut a mouse in two? No, of course not. Stupid. Can you add a bicycle steering wheel to a mouse? Of course not. Stupid. How many hand palms do you need when you're using a keyboard? Yeah, of course, two. You're, gonna, you're using a keyboard. Put two hands on there. Well, we designed a product for a company making walks. And what we did is we designed the, 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 the unit where the handles are stamped out of the same sheet than the walk itself. And we solved three problem points for them. Where, does, where is it difficult to clean? Where does all the food stay in when you try to clean your walk? In the rivets. What's the first thing that comes loose when you have a walk a long time? The handles. And actually by doing this, there was one less production process. They did not have to rivet the handles into their walk. These guys had been making walks for 30 years. And they, when we presented this to them, they were like, huh? Why didn't we think of this? This, this, this is so calm because they were not questioning the obvious. Actually, this is a little bit, is there anybody from Microsoft here? <laughs> it's going great. This is a mouse we designed, sadly enough, I, I forgot to charge it. But this is a mouse, it's flat, and then it's a presenter. It, uh, I forgot to charge it, bad me. But normally it has a laser, ah, there it is, laser pointer. When you rotate it around, it becomes a computer mouse, right? Like that, and you can use it. Every businessman needs a mouse with his notebook, every businessman needs a presenter. So that's what we innovated. When Microsoft saw the first generation of this mouse, they wanted to buy it. Sadly enough, our client and Microsoft were in a lawsuit and neither party wanted to work with each other. And that's where the ARC idea comes from. They built the ARC when they saw this product and could not buy it because the patent was owned by us. And we were under obligation with our client. We could not give it to them. Now, and we won. Why? The ARC mouse can go from big to small. That's all it does. We at least go from one product to another product. There is a reason for doing our, our product. So we thought that was a little bit of fun. Most high-end mice in the market have rubber grips on the side, right? Create invented this 15 years ago. We were working on a bicycle project where we were doing handlebars for bicycles. With that, and they had these cool ribs. So we had another client, Kensington, that was doing a high-end mouse. So we said, you know what you should do? Put these same rubber grips that you put on the handlebars of bikes, put that on a mouse. That would be super cool. They had a business program that lasted five years based on that idea. Five, this is a later generation of those mice. Five different generations of mice were based on that single idea. Not five different mice. That's 10 years of business, business almost. And actually, we were the first who did that. I already talked about this focused palm for FPS gamers where you only use one hand instead of two hands. So this is what we should do more. We should ask stupid questions more. Not really true, but we should actually um, reformulate the obvious. People that are in a certain field for a very long time, they fail to question the fundamentals of their knowledge. And sometimes by asking this stupid question, you have a chance to innovate. And design houses are actually a little bit in an advantageous position there, because we are outsiders. 
and we will bring fresh perspective to the table. So 70% of the projects that we do at Create, and we present them to our client, the first thing they will say is that, yeah, but our company doesn't know how to do this, so let's not do it. That's wrong. Then find somebody who can do it. You know, I'm sure when Apple milled a CNC milled notebook, they didn't know how to do it, but they found a company that could do it, and they innovated. A lot of companies say, yeah, but we only know how to do this, so let's keep doing this. You will not innovate. So the technical uh, limitations, right? The transfer effect, I talked a little bit about that, when we see an idea from one project, the bicycle handlebars, transfer it to a completely different project, and you innovate. And then we fall outside of that linear process, which is typical to development in a big company, where there's people breathing down your neck, you know, are you finished, are you done? My client wants to see the idea. We don't have that, so we follow strict schedules, and uh, that allows us to iterate and to build prototypes. So what did we learn today? The brave new world tells us we need to innovate. The design process instigates innovation. The client may be king, but they're not always right. Don't search for a solution until you have found the real problem. And then lastly, reformulating the obvious leads to innovation. Okay, and that's it for me today. Thank you for your attention.